kitchen ball, jawbone, he is very tall. Jawbone, ring, jawbone, sing, jawbone, tell me everything. Walk jawbone with a turkey tail, never mind that bugaboo. The loop string blue, it will not do. I want a string to tie my shoe. A cotton string, it will not do. A cotton string will break in two. Walk jawbone with a turkey tail, never mind that bugaboo. recommendations for him. Indeed it did. The good doctor advised that I should drink nothing but water. He seems to surmise that if I adhere to this water-only regimen, that I will soon come to my senses sufficiently to think it would be neither an evil to me, nor cruel to animals, to eat their flesh. Here's my reply. <coughs> Thanks for the advice on being tempted. I've broken my promise and I'm again intoxicated. Yours ever. Junius Brutus. Who? I wanted to get right to the point. Very good, Booth. Permit me to introduce the Reverend James Freeman Clark. Reverend Clark. Thank you for being so responsive and so attentive to a perfect stranger in need. Mr. Booth, it's hard to call you a perfect stranger as your great acting work precedes you, but it is a real pleasure to meet with you in person. In my travels, I find it interesting to partake in the company of as many different types of people as possible. How do you find your life, the American West? Well, I, I came here fresh from divinity school with magnificent ideas of the vast work to be done and only a vague notion of the way in which I would do it. And how is that work coming along? I expected to meet with opposition, and I found indifference. I expected infidelity, and I found worldliness. So don't get me wrong, Mr. Booth. I keep company with a good group of Christian friends, but they have brought east and brought the religion with them. On the real Western people, I find it hard to make an impression. Louisville is a tough nut to crack. What say you, Thomas? These people don't want a teacher. What they need is a fire breather. True. A solid, meditative, carefully worded sermon holds little attraction for them. They appear to like sentiment, run into sentimentalism, plenty of illustration and knockdown argument. And booze. <laughs> Those who are religious here appear to be bigots. Those who are not religious appear to care more for making money, politics, for horse racing, for drinking and for dueling than for the subtle differences in common biblical translations. I find that the temptations to drunkenness are too common and too powerful for the many weak beings here who construe the approval of a boisterous circle of intoxicated fools as the climax of everything desirable in their profession. Yeah, yeah. That may differ in their taste of the form of the cup out of which they drink this wine of the divine truth, but they all agree in their thirst for the same wine. Yeah, leaving the various cups of Christ aside, I've always been strongly attracted to rural life. The real Booth has a farm in Maryland. The real Booth is not a farmer by heart. But he endeavors. True. But the farm is more of a buffer. A buffer from what? Humanity. But you, you make your living off of the adoring throng. Oh. My life's great passion is the recitation of a few perfect lines. If I could say these words on my farm before a swarm of bees, or a flight of butterflies, or an exultation of skylarks, I would receive the same enjoyment, but hardly the same compensation. True. I do have an ever-growing family. If a swarm of bees could pay the sum of $100 a night, the world would never again see the great and wonderful Bruce. Yes, and I suspect I would retire back to my sea of tranquility in Maryland. A toast to the coming financial savvy of bees. Gentlemen, uh, forgive me for bringing down the room, but I thought we might attend to the original matter that has brought me before you. Oh, certainly. 
I have tried, rather unsuccessfully, to see the mayor about obtaining a plot in the local graveyard. Pity, but kind of trouble at all, Reverend. I'll have to keep trying and get back to you. Excellent. Thank you very much for your service, Sir Father. I believe the mayor must be out for taking in the local birch. No doubt as an original Easterner, the mayor's trying to fit in with the bloody spectacle. You do not approve. I support no activity which encourages the suffering of animals. Well, please forgive me. You are my guest, and I have offered you no refreshments. Would you care to take a glass of wine or a cigar? Please have a seat, Reverend. Thank you, Mr. Booth, but I must decline both the wine and the cigar. On a doctor's orders? No, Mr. Rice. Uh, presently, I do not require that type of stimulation. I prefer to offer any comfort or consultation to Mr. Booth that I can for his recent loss. Mr. Booth, I am at your services. That generosity of spirit is why I must have contacted you, Reverend. I have chosen wisely. Was the passing of your friend sudden? Very. Was he a relative? Distant. <laughs> You're sure you won't partake of this fine wine? No, Mr. Booth, I'm fine. Cruel drink. It's only merit of being vegetable. Well, let me try and entertain you in another way. Just before I dashed off my letter to the doctor, I was reading aloud to my friend Thomas here. Perhaps you would like to hear me read? I, I certainly should. <laughs> what shall I read? Whatever you would like to read, I should like to hear. Then suppose I attempt Coleridge's Ancient Mariner. Have you the time for it? It is long. Yes, I, I should think so. Booth, booth, booth. Must we use the same old parlor tricks on the good reverend here we use on the good riverman all up and down the Mississippi? I don't follow. The booth pulls out the ancient mariner in every port, in every tavern along America's great waterways. Upon hearing it, his own boisterous circle of intoxicated fools always rejoice at his triumph. The booth could never give over his performance merely to a swarm of bees unless those bees could buzz in the king's English. I should still like to hear you read something, Mr. Booth. Perhaps my favorite part. The end, Booth. Just read the end. The end, then. <laughs> farewell, farewell. With this, I tell the thee, thou worthy guest, he prayeth well who loveth well both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best who loveth best all things, both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. Mariner, whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar, is gone. And now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. He went like one that hath been stunned, and is of sense forlorn. A sadder and a wiser man he rode the morrow morn. I feel a, a dangerous jealousy of those drunken rivermen who have heard the full tale from you. I am so very pleased you enjoyed the reading. Did you take special note of the meaning of this passage? How so? In reference to the animals. Man should love all creatures. Uh, precisely. Uh, did you ever read really Shelley's argument against the use of animal food? Is it a free back? Yes, I have read it. Immortal upon earth, no longer hath. He slays the lamb that looks him in the face, and horribly devours his mangled flesh, which, still avenging nature's broken law, kindled all putrid humors in his frame. All evil passions and all vain belief, hatred, despair, and loathing in his mind, the germs of misery, death, and crime. Well done again, Mr. Booth. Shelley would be very pleased to hear his words spoken with such people. But what do you think of the argument? Ingenious, but not satisfactory. To me, it is satisfactory. I have long been convinced that it is wrong to take the life of an animal for our pleasure. I eat no animal food. There is my supper. And this wine is the boot dessert. Vegetarian diet is man's natural diet, and dietary perfection can bring about man's perfection. Eating a lamb does not turn a man into a wolf, Mr. Booth. You know the myth of Prometheus? Yes. Prometheus stole fire from the heavens and gave it to man. 
He was punished by the gods for being chained to a rock where a vulture would eat his liver each night. His liver would regrow and the vulture would die again. Very good, Reverend. Prometheus gave man bias, that man could put into a culinary purpose. Just as Prometheus' liver was devoured by a vulture each night, so are man's vitals devoured by the vulture of disease. All of man's vices are arisen from the ruin of his healthful innocence. Mr. Booth, you are reaching with these allegories and myths. Man of his creation was endowed with the cause for the fall of man. I wish to see no living thing suffer pain. As I've said earlier, I eat no animal food. Indeed, I think that the Bible favored this view. Have you a Bible with you? Psalms 104, 14. He calls up the grass to grow for the cattle and herb in the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. Uh, Psalms 145, 9. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion comes upon all living things. He satisfies the desire of every living being. And Isaiah 66, 3. He who slaughters an ox is like him who kills a man. Impressive, Mr. Boo. But after the deluge, God gave Noah dominion over the animals. Genesis 9 2. Upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hands are they delivered. Oh, Lord, take the maker. I see, I see, I see. I could not summon boots and berries alone. <laughs> <laughs> that promise was a curse upon all. And despite that promise, God said in Genesis 9 17, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh. Upon the earth. You have an excellent command of the scripture, Mr. Booth. I have always condemned the soulless mumbling of pastors. Who found reading such an onerous task? The Booth can command any text known to God or man. Ecclesiastes 3.19. For the fate of the sons of man, the fate of the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They have all the same breath. Man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. They all go to the same place, all are from dust, and all turn to dust again. For who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward, and the spirit of beast goes down to the earth. Mr. Boo, I am very pleased to be discussing these matters with you, but I came to perform the funeral rites of the dead, as you requested that I should. Perhaps it is time that we discuss this matter. Very well. Would you like to look upon the remains? Yes. Is this some kind of hoax? <clears throat> Pray, what is the meaning of this? Of what, sir? Of this. You requested me to come here to perform the last rites of our church over the dead, and you present to my astonishment such as a bushel full of poor wild pigeons. In Luke 12, 6. Who are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten. They are God. pigeons, Mr. Booth. Well, so they're not dead. Very true, but they are not human. They have no soul. How do you know, sir, that they have no soul? I will not presume, Mr. Booth, that you have brought me here to insult me, and I hope that your friend will find a straight waistcoat for you as soon as possible. Please, please stay a moment. You do not have to perform any rites or rituals. Please, just stay. I cannot help I feel a certain sympathy for your humanity, Mr. Booth. If you are insane, as many might surmise, your insanity is better than the cold, heartless sanity of most men. You spoke of it. You have seen with your eyes what has befallen these poor creatures. I have. All week, 
I have observed immense quantities of these pigeons flying over the city and roosting in its neighborhoods. They are for sale by the bushel in every street corner in Louisville. As Jesus said in his sermon on the mountain, look at the birds in the sky. They neither sow nor reap nor gather the bars, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Townsfolk are awash in a pigeon feast of their own. Excuse me, Mr. Booth? Ectopistis migratorius. That's what these birds are known as in the world of science. These are the wild pigeons, also known as passenger pigeons. They are the passengers of Earth. They have been fruitful and multiplied for many, many years. What right does man have to cut that journey short for a feast of flesh? I'm afraid I cannot answer that for you, Mr. Booth. But just as the angel of the seeds, and every death is on Avenger breeds, the fury passions from that blood began and turned on man a fiercer savage. Man! Man's penchant for destruction cannot be ignored. As far as I can tell, there is but one crucial distinction between us and the beasts. The distinction being? Man is far more savage. Indeed. Both man and beasts are passengers going round and round the spinning orb. But we are the true savage passengers of Earth. Humanity's careless disregard for all life is unfathomable. And if unchecked, will soon lead to our demise. War, famine, and pestilence are plenty. I see no rebuttal to your argument. These things all come from man. Yea, but what can be done? You see these innocent victims of man's barbarity. I wish to testify in some public way against this wanton destruction of life, and I wish you to help me. Me? Will you? Well, I can hardly see how I would be able to help. I did not expect to be called in to assist at the funeral solemnities of birds. Nor did I send for you to. I'm in the room to ask about the lot of the graveyard, but now you are here. Why not help me? Do you fear the lap of man? Um, <laughs> perhaps with your act, Thomas, the good reverend has more to think about, I imagine. No, I do not fear being mocked. If I agreed with you in regards to this subject, I, I might perhaps have the courage to act out my convictions. But I do not look at this as you do. There is no reason then why I should have anything to do with it. I respect your convictions, but I do not share them. But what of the slaughter over Louisville? Why not speak out against that? I will put some thought into it. Perhaps a sermon. The great number being killed is appalling. We need greater stewardship taken of the earth and its creatures. But, but I cannot agree that these pigeons have bodies or souls that merit funeral rites and burials. That is there. <laughs> I can ask no more of you. I am obliged to you for coming to see me. It was my intention to purchase a place at the burial ground and have them put into a coffin and carried in a hearse. I may yet do this without anyone's knowing that it was not a human body. Would you assist me then? But if no one knew anything about it, how would it be a public testimony against the destruction of life? But if I just don't see how that would help your cause. Very true, it would not. <laughs> well, I will consider what to do. Perhaps I may wish to bury them privately in some garden. In that case, I would happily try to find a place on the ground of some of my friends. You are too kind, Reverend. For many years, people have assumed I was awaiting placement in some insane asylum. Disagreeable notions that don't jive with common ideas are frequently at judge insane. Now, I'm here to tell you that this lunacy is often misunderstood. <laughs> Mr. Booth, from our conversations today, I do not presume you to be anything but a man of great intelligence and fabulous oratory. I, I apologize for my straight, wasteful remark. No apology needed. I have been fitted for that garment several times for behavior wholly independent of our wild passenger pigeons. Booth's troubles are much more complex. On that note, I should like to encourage you to take some heed to your doctor's advice. I will eat no animal. If he encouraged more water and less alcohol, perhaps more time for the attitude between the world of you. Perhaps. I'll take my leave and get back to you soon. Thank you so much, Reverend. Thomas, this reverend was a good choice. Are you likely to take his advice on being temperate? Well, let's see. <laughs> now, in that case, we must sally forth. We are 
fresh out. Oh, oh yes, we must replenish our stockpiles of supply. We will need them to convince the townsfolk of the error of their ways. Bring the ancient baron out. Yeah. 